Welcome everyone to the 2021 SMU Blockchain Summit hosted by the Kruth Institute for Entrepreneurship Blockchain Program Initiative at the SMU Cox School of Business in Dallas, Texas. Uh, my name is Simon Mack and I'm the Executive Director of the Kruth Institute for Entrepreneurship, the moderator for this event. I'm so glad you can join us this morning. This program is in partnership with the United States Association for Small Business and Entrepreneurship, the leading professional organization for entrepreneurship academic, academics in the world, and also the newly launched tech entrepreneurship SIG of USASB, for which I'm the chairperson this year. So I wanna give a big shout out to all the USASB members out there, especially from the tech entrepreneurship SIG. Note that this event is being recorded and will then be posted on our YouTube channel called Cox Caruth Institute. So feel free to check us out and follow our YouTube channel. Okay, let's go ahead and get the program started. This year's Blockchain Summit is gonna be a little bit different. Instead of having one or two people speak in depth about their topic, I decided to have five people speak and give a quick update on their topic. I wanted to do this because there's so much going on in blockchain and that I wanted the audience to have at least a quick introduction to several hot topics and then you can drill down deeper on your own. So we'll have five speakers, approximately 10 minutes each, and then we'll have about 10 minutes of Q&A uh, at the end of the program. So please type your questions in the Q&A feature, not in the chat feature, okay? All right, so to kick us off, I'm gonna ask Brendan, Brendan Cooper to come on down. He's gonna talk about NFTs. And so Brendan, if you can give a quick personal introduction and then jump right into talking about this thing called NFTs that's been in the news. You bet. <clears throat> well, first, uh, thank you. I'm really excited to join this uh, distinguished uh, list of panelists and to be here with you, uh, Simon. It's a great pleasure. Uh, so. Uh, my name is Brendan Cooper, and I am uh, a 10-year leader of digital transformation for the largest collectible company in the world, uh, uh, Panini SPA, based out of Modena, Italy. And over the last few years, we've identified um, a really exciting opportunity at the frontier of collectibles uh, using non-fungible token technologies. And uh, so this is uh, the subject that I want to talk about today. And I'm uh, really excited about it. It's been an explosive phenomena globally and has really captured the public uh, imagination. Okay, so, uh, so Simon, I think at this point, I'll proceed with uh, describing what, what's happening. Yeah, so, so well, why don't you just tell everybody what, what okay. is NFT? Okay, so um, an NFT, uh, technically speaking, is a token. It is a non-fungible token, which means it is not uh, divisible like a currency, which was one of the uh, earliest uh, things to emerge from uh, uh, blockchain, public blockchain infrastructures going back to Bitcoin. And so there's been this innovation where we have um, unique tokens that are created using code. The code's called a smart contract. And the construction of it is with a, a token and, and then uh, what we call metadata. And the, the token is uh, the code that rides and is immutably connected to the blockchain, as is the metadata. And the metadata in the current realization of the technology is uh, basically digital content. And it can point to uh, digital content that is on the public blockchain, or it could be digital content that is off of the public blockchain. And the, the result is, uh, and, and what's happened over the last, uh, uh, I guess, uh, nine months, in, in 2020, there were about $100 million worth of uh, NFT collectibles transacted. And in the first quarter, there were about 2.5 billion uh, NFT collectibles. Uh, and so this has really created a phenomenon where uh, uh, sports talk radio and public shows and the, the, the news media has really picked up on this. And what's exciting is uh, it's created a new distribution channel that's never existed before for 
um, all the uh, participants uh, and creators in the creator economy. So if you think about a lot of the people that are in social media on Instagram that are creating, that are influencers, there's musicians, there are artists, uh, uh, creators of all kinds. And now the, the NFT and NFT technology uh, has enabled them to go directly to uh, uh, open markets, uh, uh, decentralized markets, uh, and reach a global audience uh, for their, their art and their digital content. Um, and so that's been really, really exciting phenomena. Uh, when we talk about the uh, uh, NFTs uh, today, we have collectibles, we have art, trading cards. Uh, they can be used to create tickets, uh, like for entrance into a, a show or a concert. Uh, and digital uh, content of, of all kind can be connected uh, to a blockchain. And it's a curious form of property or collectible because uh, other people can actually uh, view it, you have control of it, but it sits in this curious space uh, uh, legally where the only rights that govern it are connected to um, uh, property law, and that's only if there's a contract. So the terms and conditions on which it's sold really matter. So if we have a physical object like a book um, or a phone or something like this, these things are physical property and they fall under existing property law. Uh, uh, these virtual goods uh, that we find on the, the, uh, uh, as NFTs, they don't have the same uh, rights uh, conferred to them by law. So the only rights you get are that which are specified in the actual, um, uh, in, in the contract that, that is uh, either signed or uh, agreed to from the service where you buy it. So that's something to, to be, uh, be mindful of. So how does, how does it actually work? Mm -hmm. Well, so... Uh, an NFT is when we say it's create when it's created, the digital content is created uh, by the, the artist or the, the, the creator. And they actually uh, go through a process called minting. And there are a lot of services out there that will help you do this and have facilities for this. And the minting process is where the digital good is bonded or connected to the blockchain using your keys and only your keys. And this is really important uh, because the way the NFT works is it's connected to your keys uh, and it is connected to the blockchain and they're inseparable. And the actual transaction, the transacting of this can be uh, done using cryptocurrencies. And the keys are transferred from you to someone else. And so in this way, uh, there's actually a, a perfect chain of custody which is a pretty exciting thing in the collectible business because there's always the, uh, been the potential for fraud. Now, this technology is in its earliest implementation and there are still uh, risks and, and problems associated with it. But I think that the larger global community has spoken and very loudly that um, digital property is something that people want, like they want it now. And whether we look at Epic Games, Fortnite, and the, you know, the hundreds of millions of users that are buying digital skins or other game environments, uh, these companies aren't employing uh, uh, NFT technology yet, but they certainly have it on their roadmap. And it is the future of digital collectibles. And so this phenomena, this recent phenomena, where we've seen this explosion of interest and participants in the NFT collectible space, um, this is pointing the way, and, and, and it's really a, 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 a ground up social phenomena where people are saying, we want uh, some claim of ownership over our digital goods. And that's a, that's a really exciting um, uh, uh, phenomena, I think. And the law hasn't caught up, the, the technology hasn't caught up, but I think uh, the, the popular culture knows what, it's, knows what it wants. So, uh, the question uh, becomes, well, how do, how, are, how do people actually make money with this? You know, what, what are, why are people doing this? Well, the possibility to, to sell it, as I mentioned earlier, um, is, is out there. And there's a large market they're developing. There's rare art and uh, uh, established categories like trading cards and, and novel ones um, like the uh, 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 videos. And, and there are... Uh, uh, open markets, lots of different markets. If you do any type of uh, search for NFTs, NFT collectibles, you'll, you'll find a lot of different choices. Um, 
the, the way to make money it is to have great content and uh, to ensure that they're scarce. You know, one of the benefits that uh, well, Ricky later uh, in the presentation will discuss is how the um, uh, the, the blockchain uh, you know delivers uh, and confers some benefits. And one of those is it can, in this case, it can ensure scarcity. So uh, having a scarce, uh, highly sought after. Uh, piece of digital content is something that you can sell for a profit. And there are lots of different places to do that. There's an emerging uh, class of professional services that are emerging to guide people through this process, whether you're professional artists or businesses. Um, there are a lot of different use cases. Um, and uh, if you go out, you can see uh, different metaverses like the Sandbox or Decentraland, where you've got gaming communities that are evolving around these things. Um, the social media environment is, is certainly captured uh, captured by this. Instagram's uh, employing uh, a new NFT platform so that they can get in on this uh, emerging phenomena. And finally, if uh, uh, the people out on the audio uh, social media uh, uh, clubhouse, uh, th there's some really developed communities out there that will guide people and take questions and and provide a lot of uh, great services. But anyway, that's kind of a, a round trip through the NFT space. It's a really exciting um, uh, proposition, and I'm excited about the future of it. Brandon, very, very good. So let me let me jump in a real quick question here, and I'm hoping it's a short answer, which is the the, the art that people are are, are NFTing. Uh, where so there's digital art, and then there's physical art. Where is the digital NFT res physically residing and where is the physical art physically residing? Well, okay, so the, the NFT technology opens up a lot of different custodial relationships to physical goods. And by that, we mean um, now I can actually have a claim of ownership on a physical good and that can be uh, owned by different people and the ownership can be transferred without actually transferring the physical good. So someone, maybe even a bank, could actually control a physical good using this technology. Now on the digital, uh, for the digital art, um, sometimes that art resides directly on the blockchain, which is a very strong protection on that uh, piece of digital art because it's immutable once it's on the blockchain. Uh, in some cases, the art is really big and it is best because it's, it's a, storage is expensive on public blockchain infrastructure. And so the, um, the digital content is actually out on um, uh, servers. It could be Amazon servers. It could be a file system called IPFS. It could be implemented in a lot of different ways. But for the people interested in getting involved, those are important distinctions to know uh, what you're buying and where it actually resides. Very good, very good. Okay, audience. Uh, thank you very much, Brendan. Audience, type in your questions about NFT for Brendan, and we'll get to them uh, at the end. All right. Thank you so much, Brendan. Okay. Next, I want to call on Professor Carla Reyes from SMU, who's going to talk about DAOs. So, Carla, if you would give a quick personal introduction and then jump right into talking about DAO. Thanks so much. Um... I'm uh, Carla Reyes. I'm an assistant professor of law at SMU Dedman School of Law. Um, I am, I've been in the blockchain legal space since about 2011 when I was a um, original member of the Perkins Coie uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency practice group. Um, I, since joining academia in 2016, my research focus has been at the intersection of blockchain technology and uh, business and commercial law. And to that end, I serve on several, um, uh, in several capacities on reform, uh, legal reform efforts at both the national and international levels uh, regarding in particular uh, commercial law uh, reforms uh, related to uh, NFTs, um, cryptocurrency, and uh, indeed uh, DAOs. So um, I was asked to talk to you uh, to give you a quick update about DAOs, uh, and in particular to uh, do the following. Um, first, what is a DAO anyway? <laughs> um, and then how do they work? And to talk about how they work through a couple of examples, because the truth of the matter is they could work in any number of ways. It just depends on the creativity of the entrepreneur and the software developer um, coding the DAO. Um, and so for those two examples, we're going to speak briefly about MakerDAO, because it's one that's out in the news quite a bit, and then uh, about Dorg, which is actually a legally recognizable uh, LLC, uh, which then leads me to the last question I was asked to discuss, uh, namely, why does the law care and maybe why should uh, entrepreneurs uh, care about DAOs? So 
Uh, to begin, what is a DAO anyway? Well, DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. Uh, and um, essentially, um, it is, an, well, it, like I said, it can happen in any number of ways. But from a technical perspective, it's usually, I should say, a network of interacting smart contracts that allow a group of people to coordinate their activity for a collective end. That collective purpose may or may not be profit seeking, right? So we tend to connect in, in the legal world anyway, uh, a group of people working together to do something with uh, to pursue profit, right? And that might be true. Uh, DAOs might be a, a group of people working together through uh, software essentially to pursue profit. Um, or it could, or, or it may be not, right? So um, it could be a DAO uh, designed to provide a service where the software provides the service and you interact with it, but ostensibly or allegedly there's no one behind the software providing the service, right? This is the promise of DeFi or de decentralized finance. Um, um, the thing to know about, I thought I included a, a tech stack uh, slide, but I didn't. The thing to know about DAOs, I think from a technical perspective is because it's confused a lot in the news media, is the DAOs sit at a different level of the technology stack than the blockchain protocol, right? So the um, blockchain protocol is your bottom layer. Then there's smart, you know, you could have just, just a smart contract running on top of it. And if they interact and work together, you've got, um, you could create on top of that an application layer and then a user interface layer. And the DAO technically fulfills like those three upper layers, right? There would be pieces of the DAO at, those, at all those upper layers and they are working on top of uh, a blockchain protocol, but they are not the same thing. And some of that confusion stems from this infamous DAO known as the DAO that sort of blew up, right? And caused um, a change in the underlying Ethereum protocol. Uh, it, well, it didn't cause a change, but a change was caused because of the DAO. And that connection there has then like forever caused confusion. So just know a DAO is different than the underlying protocol. DAOs can run on any, any number of protocols. Um, although most commonly at, at this point, um, we hear about them on Ethereum, right? That's the, the most popular one. Okay, so a couple of examples. Um, so I'm trying to be mindful of my time. Um, the first example I want to talk about is MakerDAO, which is an instance of um, providing a service where there's not necessarily a, you know, a coordinated or identifiable group of people behind it. So MakerDAO operates via uh, two tokens, essentially, two layers of tokens. The first layer of uh, tokens that everyone knows about, of course, is DAI, right? So that's what MakerDAO produces. Essentially, MakerDAO is an interlocking web of smart contracts that allow you to um, exchange your cryptocurrency, say Ether, um, for something called DAI. And DAI is a um, stable coin uh, that's pegged to the US dollar. So one DAI is, is um, meant to be $1 and the smart contracts and the algorithms uh, in the background work to, um, to keep it stable at the value of $1. But in the interim, there's another layer of tokens that govern the, uh, the DAO, MakerDAO, that isn't as talked about as often, namely Maker tokens. If you're a holder of Maker tokens, you have some governance power over the MakerDAO and you can help make decisions uh, about uh, how it operates and changes to uh, the DAO's code. But um, how does a person, again, how does it work? How does a person get a DAI? Well, <laughs> It's a little bit complicated, but essentially, if you were to follow, um, imagine arrows between these blocks, these yellow blocks of things, uh, what would happen is um, I uh, deposit essentially a, a cryptocurrency, say Ether, uh, into a vault. Um, and it could be Ether, it could be any other uh, supported ERC-20 uh, type of token, ERC-20 token being not a fungible token, but, uh, but a, um, a token uh, that's built on Ethereum. Um, and you, you deposit your Ether or your other token into a vault, uh, and that vault um, escrows your uh, tokens or Ether as collateral and essentially keeps track of how much um, dollar value, US dollar value, those uh, collateral, that collateral uh, is worth over time because uh, cryptocurrency value fluctuates quite a bit, right? So the MakerDAO's purpose is to make sure that your collateral is equal to the value of the DAI and that DAI stays pegged at $1. Then in exchange, you are issued uh, for your, what they call collateral, uh, your Ether and your um, tokens. Um, 
and exchange your issued equivalent value of DAI. So if I submit one ether and deposit an ether in the vault, um, then I get back, uh, say, six, for example, this is not an exact quote of the, the value at this moment, but for example, I get back 66 DAI. Um, then I can use that DAI uh, out in the world, but if I ever want my uh, ether or um, my tokens back, I have to give the DAI back to MakerDAO and then get back the e equivalent value of ether and tokens that the DAI is worth at that time, right? So to be clear, I am not guaranteed to get my exact ether or DAI back. I am guaranteed to get back the value of the DAI at the, um, in ether or tokens at the time that I resubmit uh, my die. Um, the uh, essential idea is that when I deposit ether and then die is minted and given to me, I, what I've created is a debt in the terms of MakerDAO um, that I have to pay back uh, later. Um, and uh, essentially what you've done then is created a collateralized debt position. So right, it's not a really a new concept. So that's why this upper box is marked CDP. You've created a collateralized debt position and that's um, sort of the, the functioning of of MakerDAO, but the idea is to create a decentralized stablecoin, one that is not operated and uh, mediated by a centralized third party that everybody has to trust. Rather, you trust the code uh, and uh, the functioning of the code. And hopefully then, right, uh, we talk about trustless trust in blockchain uh, technology, but hopefully well, who you actually trust are the holders of the Maker tokens. <laughs> Remember those Maker token holders talked about, they get to vote on how to change the code. So hopefully you trust them uh, because they're in charge of uh, how your thing works uh, over time. All right, so the second and much less exotic example of a DAO, which it, to the point that it could be anything, is Dorg. Dorg is a, a simply a, a cooperative of freelance software developers who um, work on to build DAO-related software. That's what they do. They could uh, operate through a traditional uh, cooperative um, uh, business form. They could operate through a traditional LLC, but they but instead they operate through a DAO. And um, they formed as, a, as an LLC, but through a specific law in Vermont that allows them to be a quote blockchain based LLC. And we'll talk about why that's important in a second. But the point here is it's a traditional company. It's just a cooperative of people um, uh, coordinating their economic activity through software. And uh, it's, it's much more traditional than say MakerDAO. Um, but the, the point is it could be, um, it, a DAO could really be anything and you can organize it however you want um, uh, based on the creativity of the entrepreneur, the creativity of the developer and the limits of the code and what the software can actually achieve, right? Um, as to why the law should care, um, Dior gives me a good segue to that. The, there are two main questions that the law and entrepreneurs everywhere have been asking. Well, one is centered in business law and one is centered in commercial law. Business law question is what is this thing anyway in terms of a business entity, right? So um, is MakerDAO, for example, like what is it if it's anything? Well, they haven't filed anything to be an LLC or a corporation or whatever. So to the extent that MakerDAO, Maker Governance token holders are, um, Go, uh, hold those tokens in hopes of uh, gaining some kind of profit later, it might be a partnership, right? So when a group of people get together and operate a business in pursuit of a profit, um, that makes them a general partnership if they haven't done anything else. Why is that a problem? General, general joint and several liability uh, and personal liability, right? No liability shield. So question has been, what is this thing? And if we don't like that it's a general partnership, could they be something else? And states have moved to clarify that they could be something else by creating new laws. Vermont created the block ba blockchain-based LLC, which has pr specific provisions allowing you to um, say in your operating agreement to say a uh, D org is operated by um, uh, the, these smart contracts and we defer to these smart contracts in these contexts, right? And we're not gonna change them in the future, right? That's the, the basis of the blockchain-based LLC. But it's um, super traditional in other respects, um, formalities, et cetera. Uh, and then similarly, and more recently, Wyoming uh, just adopted, and it just became effective July 1st, amendments to their uh, Wyoming LLC law. This is significant because they didn't create a separate law. They amended the existing LLC law, uh, which has served for a very long time, has served Wyoming quite well in terms of um, being a, a focus of where businesses come uh, come to live and make their home. Uh, and, um, and in that regard, the LLC law allows uh, DAOs to incorporate as long as, uh, to form an LLC, as long as they use 
the term LLC and DAO together or LAO and LLC together. And as long as they select to be, they, they tell you whether they are member managed or algorithmically managed. And then the uh, traditional rules about LLCs change slightly depending on your election of member management or algorithmic management. The other question that lawyers and um, business entrepreneurs ask is what about my stuff? If I'm, a, if I'm a, um, a DAO and I hold digital assets, how do I make sure, as uh, Brendan was uh, indicating earlier, how do I make sure it's my stuff? <laughs> what are the rules around that and what um, contract questions do I have? And so commercial law is working in particular uh, to look at um, uh, when digital assets are used as collateral, uh, how do you get priority in those, um, in those assets? How do you ensure perfection in those assets? Because the, the existing rules, you, you could do it, but it's not super easy. It's a little bit cumbersome for, for digital uh, providers. And then secondarily, when it comes to custodian questions, or particularly around NFTs and say digital gold, um, what custodian rules apply? Um, because traditionally, when we think of custodians in commercial law, we think of intermediated securities, and it's not quite the same, the same rubric. And then lastly, um, the question uh, uh, for entrepreneurs becomes, does, uh, do DAOs enable uh, new forms of governance, right? Can we think of, can we take advantage of DAOs and software uh, coordination enabled by DAOs to flatten our governance structures, to go from CEO, yeah, you know, middle management, et cetera, to something flatter, something more like uh, what the sharing economy tried uh, to um, approximate, but, uh, but something more true in that regard. So that's, that's what I've got for you. Uh, if you have questions, please do feel free to reach out either now or later. Thanks. All right, Carla. Wow. Uh, just to rem that, that was a lot of really good information. Just to remind the audience, we're recording this and we're posting this on YouTube. So you can go back and listen to what Carla said. So thank you so much, Carla. Appreciate that. All right. We're going to sort of continue on this legal theme. I mean, who, who knew the law would get involved in blockchain so much? I want to call up Professor Lee Bracter from Dallas Baptist University, just down the road from us at SMU. Uh, he had he started something called the Texas Blockchain Council. So Lee, come on up and give a quick introduction to yourself and what is this Texas Blockchain Council? Well, thank you, Dr. Mack. Uh, and uh, anytime I get to hear from Carla Reyes, I learn a lot. So. Uh, also tough to follow, Carla, uh, regarding legal matters, because I am not an attorney. I'm a political science professor. Uh, but as Simon said, I founded the Texas Blockchain Council about two years ago. Uh, we're working to make Texas a leader in blockchain innovation, uh, partnering with states like Wyoming and others uh, that have kind of forged a path, and just bringing the, the weight of the Texas economy uh, to bear and, and part of this discussion as when it comes to a national level, we want to bring the Texas delegation uh, on board as well. So I'm going to share my screen um, here briefly. Okay. So we are a 501c6 trade association. Um, Hester Peirce, one of the SEC commissioners herself, said that states make great policy experimentation incubators. So while many of you think of the federal government and DC is where blockchain is regulated, uh, the states have a, quite a bit of leeway. Uh, and I'll talk about two areas, both in you know, statute and in regulation, that Texas has uh, forged a, a path ahead for other states to follow in just a moment. So we are a 501c6 industry association. We have member companies, individual members. We have uh, committees and subject matter experts. Um, employ lobbyists, obviously, and, and connect and educate legislators. One of the biggest things we do is education. We educate legislators, uh, policymakers, staffers about the technology in all forms, right? Uh, we educate them about uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. We educate them about blockchain for supply chain, uh, DAOs, um, really any kind of, of blockchain implementation that you can think of that, or really that they have questions about. We, uh, we provide education. So we had four policy objectives for the last legislative session. We actually were able to um, work with our legislative champions to get two pieces of legislation passed in Texas. One of them is House Bill 1576, which creates a blockchain working group, um, 16 members from uh, both from the legislature and the general public uh, to come together to create a roadmap for how Texas is going to uh, invest and pursue this technology. And more importantly for this conversation, 
um, House Bill 4474, which is um, an amendment to the Uniform Commercial Code. Uh, we actually partnered with Uniform Law Commission and, and Carla uh, and her team of attorneys on the Emerging Tech um, Subcommittee of the ULC to uh, gain uh, insights as to how to, to formulate the language to change uh, the Uniform Commercial Code in Texas, just like business law, um, to, to be, uh, to first do no harm, but also to allow innovators and entrepreneurs to feel um, comfortable and confident in the regulatory environment. So those two bills were passed. Um, Senator Angela Paxton and Representative Tan Parker uh, led the charge there from the House and the Senate. Uh, they were bipartisan, so House Bill 4474 had just as many Democrats as Republicans um, sign on to it, so we were uh, excited to see that. Um, and here's here's really what it does. Let me move this out of the way so you guys can see that. Um, what, it, what it does is, is three important things. It defines what virtual currencies are. It defines what it means to control a virtual currency, and that is through the possession of uh, crypt the cryptographic key or the majority of keys, if it's a multi-sig arrangement. Uh, and then it also um, establishes what it means to perfect the security interest in uh, a virtual currency, which uh, I won't get too deep into that. Uh, if you have questions about that, I can maybe talk a little bit about it uh, as far as the Texas context and what that allows for in collateral arrangements. But if you have questions about it from a legal perspective, Carla's probably um, a better person to, to talk with about the Uniform Commercial Code and the history uh, there. Also, um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that um, the Texas Banking Commissioner, Mr. Charles Cooper, um, made an announcement two weeks ago that didn't really get a lot of media attention, but is pretty profound. He, he provided administrative guidance to Texas chartered banks that they can custody digital assets. So many of you will be familiar uh, with the OCC's um, proclamation by Brian Brooks uh, a few years ago that federally chartered banks can custody digital assets. Now that Brian Brooks is no longer the head of the OCC, they've said that that policy is under review. They're not necessarily saying they're gonna change anything, but it made a, little, a few people nervous. So the Texas Department of Banking wanted to uh, go ahead and uh, confirm that as long as they're the, the banks are providing the correct uh, custody solutions and regulatory framework in order to keep these digital assets and virtual currencies safe, um, they, can, they can then do that. And I use the term virtual currency because that's the, the term that uh, is used in, in legal settings. We all know that to mean uh, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ether, uh, or, or other cryptocurrencies. Now, when we talk about these cryptocurrencies from a federal level, there are some differences, right, between Bitcoin and, like, say, an altcoin like Ravencoin or some other coin, because um, the SEC has said Bitcoin and Ether are sufficiently distributed not to be securities, right? They didn't, you know, hit the, the Howey test threshold, but they haven't really provided as much guidance on some of the other altcoins yet. So um, there are some distinctions uh, from the SEC's perspective, but um, you know, fewer distinctions from, from the state's perspective, uh, and Texas charter banks could custody, um, you know, virtual currencies. It's more about the custody solutions and that those solutions meet the, the required security thresholds than, than actually what the, the asset or the virtual currency is. Um, I will also just put in a quick plug. In Austin, Texas, on October 8th, we're hosting uh, the Texas Blockchain Summit uh, it's really a policy conference for industry professionals, policymakers. Um, there'll be a bunch of, you know, big companies in the space in the space that that um, will be sponsoring. They'll have speakers there. We'll have a Bitcoin mining panel, a digital assets policy panel. Um, there'll be keynote speaker or keynote addresses from uh, Senator Lummis from Wyoming, the Texas Banking Commissioner, uh, Nick Carter, Nick Batia. So, so you guys may have heard of, of those folks. Um, so that, again, is October 8th in Austin, Texas. I uh, would love for, for you guys to join us at that. You can uh, reach me at lee at texasblockchaincouncil.org or DM me on Twitter um, if you have any questions about what we're working on, uh, especially if you're in Texas. Now, if you're not in Texas, 
I'm going to uh, speak briefly. I know there's a lot of people on the call that are not from Texas. Um, let me connect you to the state association in your state if you're if you're in the U.S. There's about 30, 25 to 30 states that have uh, various state associations. Uh, most of them are 501c6s, which is like a chamber of commerce for the state for blockchain uh, or crypto. Uh, some of them are 501c3s or, or LLCs or things like that. Um, but most of the big states, you know, of course, California, New York, Florida, um, Arizona, Colorado, Nebraska, uh, I could probably, North Carolina, South Carolina. Yeah, so about half the states in the country, I could list off uh, several more had these associations. And we have a loose confederation that we talk every month as a, a state association directors and uh, just share best practices. Uh, so if you wanna be connected to the state association in your uh, state and you wanna actually drive policy change and drive change on the political uh, front, uh, I'd be happy to, to help connect you. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to um, Professor Mack. All right, Woo. thank you, Lee. And by the way, thank you for you and the organization's effort to legislate for blockchain in the state of Texas. So yes, thank you yes. for doing that. All right, next I want to call up Professor Ulrika Schultz from SMU, who's going to be talking about some very interesting academic research that she's been working on. So Ulrika, come on down and I give a brief introduction and just jump right into your blockchain research. Okay, hi. Well, thank you very much, Simon. Um, yes, this has been an amazing experience just to be part of this panel already and to meet, um, you know, so many people in at Texas and uh, the community, you know, that's working in the, you know, in the blockchain space. So it's really been a lot of fun for me already. Um, so yes, I am a professor in the Information Technology and Operations Group um, here at the Cox School of Business um, at Southern Methodist University. And, um, you know, being charged with uh, things like teaching students about digital strategy and um, so on. One of the key questions that has come up for me is when should we be blockchaining at all? Um, and this is really the project that I'll be talking about. Um, this is a collaboration with Simon and um, uh, some other folks in the Texas space uh, that have been working in the blockchain entrepreneurship space. Um, and um, so so that's what basically I'll be trying to address here is when to blockchain. And a lot of um, the impetus for this research has been also practitioners, especially CIOs. So I am a member, um, actually also a fellow of the Society for Information Management, um, which is, uh, uh, you know, also called SIM, which is an international organization. Um, and so one of the topics that obviously comes up there is, you know, what it, you're not sure people understand what blockchain is, but should we be investing in it, um, you know, as organizations, especially as, um, you know, established organizations. Um, and so, um, so basically, uh, this, this framework that um, Simon and, um, you know, some of our, uh, uh, you know, this research project we've been working on. Um, and let me just, um, uh, is it sharing right now? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, okay, so we just um, get it to, to display properly. All right, so this is essentially the two by two. And um, the idea here is to first of all figure out, so what are the key dimensions um, that we should be considering um, with regard to a business process? So, um, or rather sort of a, a business model, right? So what is what is sort of a business model? What are the things that we do in the, inside this business model um, that we need to understand and, um, you know, categorize in order to figure out when we should be blockchaining and, um, you know, when possibly, there's more value is associated with it versus uh, possibly less value. Um, and so um, on the um, X axis, right, we've got network complexity. Um, and so, you know, the larger the network, the more complex the, um, the, the transactions, the more diverse the actors. Um, essentially, there's a sense that blockchain as a distributed organization, which essentially is what Carla has been explaining to us, you know, makes sense. 
difference um, because you know the the more complexity you have, um, the the more there's um, the issues of uh, you know the complexity of a centralized infrastructure and the costs associated with a, a centralized infrastructure, right? So that's the one dimension. The other dimension um, has also been touched upon. Um, here, which is the issue of um, uh, the asset. What kind of asset are we dealing with? Are we dealing with a virtual asset or with a physical asset that we're trying to manage? Um, and so the question of, you know, where's the, is this digital art or is this physical art and, and how do we, you know, what are the parameters around that in terms of a blockchain solution? And so the key issue here is um, how difficult is it to verify that the asset is, um, uh, you know, real. <laughs> Let's just put it that way, right? Um, that it's authentic. Um, and so the more complex this verification is, the more likely blockchain is going to be useful to you. And the reason um, for this is, uh, you know, the security features and the, um, that blockchain offers. And so, um, you know, the, the issue of traceability, um, you know, chain of custody, all of these uh, kinds of, of issues, right, become really important um, uh, when, when it comes to asset verification. Okay, so basically, once we have these dimensions, um, we, you know, can create this two by two. And any two by two worth its salt, right, uh, suggests that the top right hand quadrant is most probably the area where you're going to get the most bang for your buck, right? Um, and the bottom left quadrant is the area where possibly this is the starting point, you know, of a project that you then expand either to the, you know, top, uh, top left or uh, bottom right. Um, and so uh, the, the framework we have here is first of all, you know, even if uh, blockchain is used in an area where you have low complexity of networks, so only few actors, you know, we're all um, uh, sort of in agreement with how things work and we have established networks already, right? So, um, you know, think of, uh, of, of the banking networks that we have, um, then essentially, um, you know, we can still benefit from blockchain because it's going to uh, provide us with uh, basically more frictionless uh, uh, transactions. Um, and so here, a key application or key business model is integration. Um, so if we take, for example, a hospital, you know, or a hospital system that wants to integrate its systems using blockchain to essentially affect this integration is one solution people are working with. Um, JP Morgan coin is sort of another example. This is a coin that is used only within JP Morgan to essentially affect transactions between accounts. Um, because other, you know, if you if you use the entire banking infrastructure, not only does it take time to you know make the account transfer, but it also needs to go through multiple networks, which then costs you transaction fees every time. So if you can build your own network internally using blockchain, you've got the security and you have the cheaper cost. Moving to the bottom right, then the secure transaction ecosystem. So again, once we're in a more complex environment, we can speak about more of an ecosystem. And here, a key um, advantage, um, which is also what, what Brendan, you know, referred to is not only creating the scarcity, but also, um, you know, basically having very secure uh, payment infrastructure that is also fast and low cost. So an example here is um, Vento, which is a toll road system in Portugal that has implemented blockchain. And um, there the idea is, you know, that, that these toll roads are Portugal are privately owned. And so each time you are taking, you know, driving along a toll road, you're handed off from one party to the next party to the next party. And so um, in order again to not have these, these micro transactions that each time cost you money, you know, having a blockchain that essentially creates a network for all of the players. And you could imagine also then incorporating the gas stations, you know, along the toll road as well as any of the, the you know, vendors, uh, food vendors and so on into this entire system of, um, you know, payment settlements. Um, again, lower cost and, and much higher speed. Um, 
And of course, in this quadrant, you know, security is a big piece. And I would say that a lot of the cryptocurrencies, um, you know, are definitely in this space. And I think a lot of the non-fungible tokens are also in this space. Um, then, um, you know, one thing we haven't talked about yet today is um, the role of uh, blockchain in credentialing. Um, it has a huge role in, in terms of actually credentialing, um, you know, uh, both physical objects as well as, you know, people earning degrees, for example. So this is an area where, um, you know, universities have been uh, quite interested in essentially creating digital diplomas and MIT has such a solution where, you know, irrespective of where you go and, you know, how, when, when you graduated from the college, um, you can always uh, prove that in fact you earned a degree. Um, and um, without having to go back to the registrar and say, you know, I need evidence that in fact I graduated from your college, right? So that there are ways um, through a blockchain solution for people to be able to check or for you to be able to demonstrate very easily that in fact you earned a certain degree or diploma. Um, and um, interestingly enough, um, you know, the, the island of Malta has, um, you know, been very active in um, taking its educational institutions and creating blockchain-based um, uh, credentialing uh, systems. So this is about, you know, self-sovereign identity, right, that you can demonstrate at any point in time who you are and, um, you know, what, uh, you know, what degrees, for example, you've earned. Um, then, of course, the, uh, you know, the, the big stories that we've heard, at least uh, in, in business, <laughs> about, um, you know, the, the ecosystem, sort of the blockchain, are the large solutions like Maersk uh, Trade Lens, where the idea is that globally, you know, we have a supply chain, a physical supply chain that is now managed through blockchain. So instead of having documents and pieces of paper, you know, accompanying uh, physical goods like flowers grown in Africa that then have to be shipped all the way to Europe, um, you know, all the various bits and pieces of a global supply chain, you know, are incredibly expensive um, because, you know, most players have different kinds of systems that don't integrate very well. And so the idea that we could replace all of this with a, a blockchain solution to enable global trade um, is uh, really, you know, sort of, uh, um, I would say, the holy grail uh, for a lot of companies. And at the same time, it is, of course, very, very challenging. Um, and so this is um, really what this project is about, having established this, this framework, which by and large, the feedback we're getting from practitioners is that it is useful. Um, but the next step uh, in this in this uh, Study is really to figure out, you know, what are the opportunities and challenges in each of these, and also, you know, what are the variations and um, uh, and as technology and the legal system, you know, is adapting because this is of course all a moving space, um, you know, how what kind of subcategories might we be seeing or what kind of clusters of um, uh, solutions are we seeing in each of these uh, quadrants? So. I think with that, I'll stop here, Simon. All right, thank you so much, Ulrika. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll make a plug for Ulrika's research. If your company want, would like to be interviewed for this framework, we are seeking companies and projects and case studies for the framework. So please contact Ulrika. So thank you so much for doing that. All right, last but not least, I wanna call Amina Baram, an SMU student who just started the SMU Blockchain Club. So Mina, come on up and tell us your vision for the club and, and how can the audience, both students and others, get involved with the club? Well, thank you guys for having me. <laughs> but before I kind of get into the main subject of uh, my portion, I want to talk a little about, about myself and how I got involved in blockchain. So I'm going to be a senior at SMU and I study finance with a concentration in alternative asset management uh, with a minor in Spanish and statistics. But um, the way I got into blockchain was actually through my past experience. So I started at Plutus 21 Capital my freshman year 
And uh, that it's a hedge fund that's based in Dallas, and they primarily invest in alternative assets, specifically blockchain technology and digital assets. So I worked there for about a few years, learning all about cryptocurrency, trading, research, and it just became a passion of mine um, outside of work as well. And then from there, I did the Girls to Invest program, uh, and then that led me to my opportunity at Merrill Lynch uh, on the alternative asset strategy team. And I currently am interning there on their capital market side. Uh, so that's a little bit about me, but now let's move on into um, the main subject. So SNU Blockchain Club was started this past year just to introduce students to blockchain technology, cryptocurrency, and just get a start in this space because a lot of students were interested in the topic, but they didn't know really where to go to learn more about it. And so I thought it was a good idea to share my knowledge and my passion as well. Uh, so I want to start off uh, this meeting a little differently, and I want to ask a few questions to the audience and uh, just keep them in the back of your mind um, before I discuss them. So I want to look, have you look at this image <laughs> and think, what is this and how much would this cost to you? So look at this image of this cat <laughs> and think of, you know, what, what is the value of it to you? And we're going to look at another image. You know, what is this image and how much would this cost or how much would you pay for this um, uh, image right here? Well, <laughs> there's an answer. So these are NFTs, as Brendan explained earlier, and these are uh, artists. So these are these are art NFTs that you can collect. The first one is uh, from CryptoKitties. Um, it's a platform where you can find, buy customizable cats um, that sell for pretty high prices. <laughs> and the one that you see in this in the top corner is a founder cat. So it's one of the earlier iterations of uh, the platform. And the second one is a digital artist named Beeple. And recently this piece sold for about $6.6 .6 million. So uh, there's a lot of money in NFTs, I guess. And um, it's a really interesting space. And, you know, you might be thinking, you know, what is the value of this? Why is it, does it cost so much? But these are the, trying to, the kind of questions we try to answer with SNU Blockchain Club, we have discussions about this and um, teach students more about different assets you can purchase within blockchain. And the last one, you guys probably know uh, this image, but um, it's Bitcoin. So uh, that's probably one of the major cryptocurrencies that probably everyone in this um, discussion is aware of. Um, but what do these all have in common? Blockchain. <laughs> so, uh, you know, blockchain technology structure that stores transactional records, also known as a block, uh, on several databases known as a chain, and they're connected to uh, through peer to peer nodes uh, on a digital ledger. And so, our goal is to kind of connect all of these topics and teach students about, um, yeah, different assets within blockchain. And so, right now, the team is pretty small. So, the vice president is Alexis Cisneros. We actually work together at Plutus, and that's why I met him. And um, he focuses more on the coding side of Blockchain Club. And I'll get into a little bit of the topics that we've discussed so far. Uh, so a few discussions we've had is the history of blockchain. I did a presentation about, you know, the start of it. Why was it, you know, created, uh, which is, you know, after the recession in 2008. But um, uh, then we had a session about all about Ethereum. We, we discussed the Ethereum blockchain and DApps, you know, the applications that are built upon it. And then we did a Solidity coding session, and that was just to learn more about building smart contracts and um, how to get started on learning Solidity, if that's what you want to continue to do. And then we had another session about cryptocurrency, worth it or worthless, where we discussed the research behind finding a good currency versus a bad one, because a lot of my time at Plutus was that kind of research, was looking through uh, lists of cryptocurrencies and finding the good ones versus the bad ones. Um, and then we had two, uh, we had a speaker event with Plutus 21 and um, Hamid is on and Richard Rice is, are also SMU alums. And they spoke about the future of crypto, uh, blockchain itself, and then recent news and events. And then we also had a mock portfolio competition because a lot of the students were interested in investing. So I thought to myself, let's not use real money just yet. <laughs> let's practice a little bit. So I gave everyone a, a budget and, um, guidelines on you know how to invest and they had a week to put together their portfolio and then uh the person at the highest uh with the highest return won a prize and that really put into like the volatility of cryptocurrency to students so they got a really first-hand experience i remember receiving texts from other members like oh my portfolio is up 50 percent and then it's like down 20 percent and they were like panicking throughout the process but 
Uh, it, was, it was really interesting to watch. Um, so current pro project that I'm working on that I want to share with other students is building NFTs. So this is a, a very early model of the final product, but I'm using Blender, which is a 3D modeling program to build um, you know, digital art and sculptures they could potentially sell on art markets. I know there's a few that are available like OpenSea and uh, Rarible is another one. Um, I plan to share this with students next semester and how to build one for themselves. Um, and yeah, our goal is mainly just education and an investing skill set because a lot of students, you know, they're, they're, they're finance majors, so they're really interested in, but in the investing aspect. So I included that in one of our goals. Uh, we meet every other Thursday at 7 p.m. Right now, our location is on Zoom, but maybe this semester, if we're back in person, we'll have a room to actually meet in. Um, and you can follow us on Instagram for more information. I upload regularly uh, at SMU Blockchain Club. And that's all I have for today. I really appreciate being a part of this panel and speaking to all of you. So thank you guys so much. All right. Thank you again. Thank you, Mina, for leading the charge with our students uh, here at, uh, at SMU. Okay. So let's go ahead. Uh, looks like we, maybe we have time for maybe one or two questions. So it looks like most of the questions on the Q&A uh, had to do with the uh, uh, we have to do with NFTs, but it looks like a lot of them have been answered. Uh, it seems to, Jessica says, it seems like there's a lot of possible applications of NFT. Where else do you see NFT technology going for the future? And so, Jessica, when you say uh, technology going for the future, uh, I'm going to bet space. Can I just throw in space? Because that's kind of what's in the news now. So. So, so, Brendan, what do you think? Where, where else can NFT take us? Well, so, you know, NFT is already having a transformational effect on supply chains. Um, I think uh, Professor Ulrich talked about that. Um, the other places, NFTs are going to evolve into much more sophisticated instruments, okay? They can be used to wrap cryptocurrencies. They're going to be able to insert themselves into um, real estate, <laughs> excuse me, real estate, insurance, uh, lots of major industries are going to be affected by and benefit from really, really sophisticated uh, implementations of the NFT technology. Very good, very good. So I have 8.59 and just like what we do in the classroom, I know the students wanna leave as soon as the bell rings. And so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up this session. And again, this concludes our 2021 SNU Blockchain Summit. Uh, this is being recorded, and so you can watch it on the Cox Carruth Institute YouTube channel. I want to thank again USASBE and the Tech Entrepreneurship SIG for partnering with us on this program. I want to thank our five outstanding panelists, Brendan Cooper, Carla Reyes, Lee Bratcher, Eureka Schultze, and Mina Baram for spending their morning with us. Uh, I want to thank the SCU support team. James Stewart and Nancy Hong for helping us put all this together. And from all of us at the Group Institute for Entrepreneurship at SMU in Dallas, Texas, we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. Goodbye.